Okay, good day. It's my pleasure here to have with us today, Dr. Susan Fagan, in part of the series I'm calling Reflections from Pharmacy Leaders Advancing the Profession. Uh, Dr. Fagan is the Albert Jowdy Professor and Distinguished Research Professor at the University of Georgia and an Assistant Dean there. She's a leader in translational research, especially in the area of stroke and cerebrovascular diseases. She recently received the ACCP, the American College of Clinical Pharmacy Therapeutics Frontier Lecture Award. And she has served on the Board of Regents and the Research Institute Board of Trustees for ACCP. So welcome, uh, Dr. Fagan. Thank you, Terry. All right. So the first question um, that I'd like to ask is we'd like to learn more about your journey to your uh, development as a recognized leader in, in your field. And in that response, you may want to include uh, key events or people that influence you in your journey. Okay, thank you. Um, I grew up in the eastern part of Canada and, at that, and uh, there was only one pharmacy school at that time in eastern Canada. And I, I decided at 11 that I wanted to be a pharmacist and I never changed my mind since then. Um, so I knew and all the way through high school where I was going and um, I got to Dalhousie University in the pharmacy program when I was 17 and I started working in a pharmacy that summer after my first year and it was the first time I realized that some pharmacists didn't really love what they did and uh, this young pharmacist who came in said she was only 25, only 40 more years. And um, it was discouraging for me. And I, was, I found myself wondering why, you know, I wanted to be a pharmacist since I was 11. So from that time, I was really trying to seek while I was even in pharmacy school at that young age, what's the magic? Where is the magic in pharmacy? And I just loved all the courses I took. And when I started studying therapeutics, I was inspired by the one PharmD we had at that time who was teaching us how to use drugs in people. And, and we used the Code of Kimball textbook and it really captured my imagination. And I said, I want to be like that. I'd never really even seen a clinical pharmacist in action, but just in the classroom, I thought that knowledge base was so exciting. So, I went to work in a pharmacy, community pharmacy in a small town in Nova Scotia, but with the, in the back of my mind that I would go back to school and get my PharmD. So um, there was no PharmD programs in Canada at that time. So I applied to a few in the States um, and I got into Buffalo. And Buffalo um, at that time was um, very highly regarded, a small post-baccalaureate PharmD program and had a lot of Canadians since it was on the border. Um, and I enjoyed that very much, even though it was very intense. I had Gerhard Levy for pharmacokinetics and I, I really wasn't even taught pharmacokinetics in my BS program, but um, just pharmaceutics. But I, I, I liked the intensity and I loved um, what it was to be in a hospital where it was open 24 seven and you could work as long as you wanted. There was always things to do and learn. And I really loved that. And um, my advisor was Fran Django, who um, was starting to get interested in stroke research. And so I was assigned to him as um, his, one of his advisees. And so when he had the opportunity to have a research assistant, I volunteered and was hired in my second year of the PharmD program. And that was fabulous, I loved it. I recruited patients for a clinical trial that was being led by one of the neurologists there and they were stroke. So during that process, I said, he tried to convince me, you should do a fellowship so you can gain more competence in research. But I was anxious to get back to Canada. And so I said, no. So then I looked at the jobs in Canada and there weren't very many. And so I decided, no, I think I'll stay for a fellowship. So I stayed and did a two year fellowship in neuropharmacology that really um, got me interested in even translational research, although we didn't use the term back then. 
I did animal models of disease and it was the blind leading the blind. It was terrible. We just read about the models and tried to replicate them in both gerbils and rats. And although it was exciting, um, it wasn't a good way to learn how to do models <laughs> of disease. You really need to see it. You can't get all the details out of the, out of the journals. So anyway, did that and then I was recruited to Wayne State University where um, I didn't get my own lab, I didn't get a startup, but I was tenure track and um, I wanted to work with the stroke team there in clinical research. And I had an opportunity to work in the lab of some people who were doing federally funded research in stroke models. And I learned more as a very junior person there. Um, so um, that's when I said, you know, I started to do really quality um, animal research in stroke and under other people's lab. I never had my own lab. Um, I know this is going on and on, Terry. I, <laughs> oh, I'm watching the time. We're good. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. But um, I finally decided I wanted to have a lab. So I, after I got promoted and tenured, I, I decided to do a sabbatical so I could get the competency to run my own laboratory. So I went to UCSD in the laboratory of Justin Zivin, who was um, actually the scientist who had published the, the study in science in 1985 that led to us studying TPA for stroke. So it was him and uh, he had no idea why a pharmacist would want to come work with him, but it wasn't going to cost him anything and he might get something out of it. So I went there for nine months and learned how to do um, experimental stroke research so I could have my own lab. Wow. And that was from Wayne State. And uh, then I got back um, to Wayne State and I still didn't have a lab. So I looked for opportunities to have my own lab, ended up at Georgia, and I've been here for 20 years. Wow. So um, that's that's sort of the, the key decision points in my translational research. Um, but during that time also, I, I never wanted to just be a scientist. I very much was drawn to being a leader because I, even as an assistant professor, I saw there's a need for organization and groups together. And I saw the downside of having every man for himself or every woman for herself. On an, uh, in an academic environment. So I, I nurtured those things all the way through too. So while I was doing the research. Wow, thank you very much for those uh, insights into your journey. Now, uh, the next question I ask is, what do you believe will be your legacy in 20 years? And I paraphrase that question, I'm looking at your contribution, what are you most proud of in terms of your contribution, which you believe has helped advance the pharmacy profession? Um, I think the my legacy, I think, um, is I'm one of a very few uh, number of people who came from, you know, just the PharmD, um, very minimal basic science training, but reinvented myself through years. Um, I was already a full professor before I had my own lab, so I had to learn all that and compete at the national level for federal funds to run my lab. Um, so I think I'm, I'm known for that, for having that um, ability and um, showing that it's possible. And then I was very committed to the development of the training programs at ACCP to help other PharmDs who have the clinical knowledge then get the skills they need to then contribute to the science of their peers. And um, I'm proud of that contribution. I was one of many at that of development of FIT program and the subsequent iterations of that. Um, as far as at the University of Georgia, I think uh, I'm very proud of the 20 years I've spent there because I advocated for the new building. They hadn't had a, a building of their own in almost 50 years of being on that campus in Augusta Medical College of Georgia. And I, I worked very hard and um, for probably eight years to get our own space. And we got that in 2016. And uh, 
just in 2019, we finally got our own lab. And I think um, having a wet lab that on our, our campus in Augusta has allowed us open doors for us for the future to have um, our own space that we can continue to build our, our science and therapeutics. So my contributions to the science on the Augusta campus and the facilities, I, I think I'm very proud of. Very good. Thank you very much for that. So words of advice for students in their professional journey. How, especially as they develop as a leader, and leader, we're saying the little, advancing, influencing others to advance the profession. Yes, I think that, you know, and I tell my students this, that if you're surrounded by people who have a neg who are in your profession but have a negative countenance, then you need to remove yourself from that and find the people who have that positivity and that optimism. Because if I had stayed within that environment, my first encounters with pharmacists, um, it would not have led to the rich career that I've had. And, the ins and being around inspirational people um, has always been and continues to be uh, what drives me and, and what gives me a lot of hope and optimism. So when I started to get involved at ACCP, for example, get around the leaders, you know, and um, find out what makes them tick and um, how they conduct themselves and how they feel about things. And um, that will inspire you, you know, being on, being with colleagues and, and uh, hearing their stories and their hopes for the future, um, very important. And it's what propels everyone forward, I think. Mm -hmm. Never be content. Right, that's great. And, and that's great words, because that's very consistent with what these interviews will do for students as they listen mm -hmm. to various leaders all over in different in settings. Beautiful, thank you very much for that. So the, my final question, uh, it, it's a history course, so in, in uh, you know, as we study the decades of the 2020s, one of the things we'll mention as a key event in this decade will be the COVID-19 pandemic. And, um, and we'll, like other things in history, things that happen in the world helps to shape uh, our profession. And how do you see the COVID-19 pandemic being, you know, recorded in history as it being an opportunity for our, the profession of pharmacy? Yes, um, it's been devastating, but there have been some good things that have come out of it already. I was going on my daily walk this morning and I realized we're probably going to miss this quiet and we're probably going to miss this time for reflection because I've been doing a lot of that in, in these last couple of months and uh, it's probably, it's been a good thing. But the other thing, and I told our graduating students just a couple of weeks ago that you were graduating into a different world and you're gonna have opportunities that come from this. And one of them is we have this resurgence of respect and admiration for all healthcare professionals that our, our current graduates are gonna benefit from, but they're also gonna have to live up to. And I think there's opportunities and we're already seeing it come to be for pharmacists to get involved in public health. And although that's been a growing field in pharmacy practice, I think it's going to come to the forefront and we're gonna to have to vaccinate 7.5 billion people um, in the near future. And I hope that pharmacists are on the forefront of that. So we're gonna have more opportunity, but higher expectations. So I see it as opening some avenues. I mean, maybe even saving the community farms because in the COVID, everything was shut down except for community pharmacies and, and grocery stores. And our community pharmacies became our lifeline again. And I think that is a great, that's gonna be good for pharmacies. So, uh, you know, I, I'm worried about what our world is going to be when we emerge from this, but I'm really not worried about the role of pharmacists. I think our young, very well-trained, clinically astute,
pharmacy graduates will rise up and bubble up to help keep us all safe. Very good. Thank you very much. I really appreciate those insights. Thank you. It's been You're a welcome. pleasure.